Good afternoon, everybody. We're going to call this meeting to order. First on our agenda is the 85th special session, and I'll entertain a motion to go into special session at this time. So moved, Mark. Second. I have a motion and a second made by Mr. Metzner. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, say no. The first item on our special session agenda is the introduction of an ordinance to amend Chapter 117, Recycling and Refuse Collection of the City Code. Mr. Mayor, I hereby move the Mayor and City Council introduce an ordinance to amend Chapter 117, Recycling and Refuse Collection of the Code of the City of Hagerstown. These amendments modify the provisions regarding storage and set out of recycling and refuse in order to provide additional protections for our neighborhoods and downtown from blight and nuisance condition. Changes include one requiring outdoor storage of recycling and refuse in receptacles and containers with sealing lids. Two requiring set out of recyclables and refuse in the downtown area in receptacles and containers with sealing lids. Three requiring properties with four or more dwelling units to designate one storage area for recycling and refuge receptacles and containers and four requiring storage of recycling and refuge receptacles and containers out of front yards front porches public right-of-ways and out of view of south prospect street unless special circumstances exist to warrant alternative locations a policy on acceptable special circumstances for alternative locations for storage of recycling and refuge receptacles and containers shall be approved by the mayor and city council under separate motion and prior to the effective date of this ordinance. Second. Motion made by Mr. Metzner, second by Mr. Munson. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed say no. Motion carries and the ordinance is introduced. Item two on the special session agenda is the introduction of an ordinance to amend chapter 64-8 property maintenance code section 202 of the city code. Mr. Mayor, I have moved the Mayor and City Council introduce an ordinance to amend Chapter 64-8, Property Maintenance Code, Section 202, General Definitions of the Code of the City of Hagerstown. These amendments modify the definition of approved receptacle and container refuse cans to be consistent with the definition in Chapter 117, Recycling and Refuse Collection. The amendment to both chapters of this code regarding recycling and refuse storage and set out are intended to provide additional protections for our neighborhoods and downtown from blight and nuisance conditions. Second. Motion made by Mr. Alshire, and I heard Ms. Nye first, so Ms. Nye gets the second. Any discussion? Yes. Anyone who believes that this isn't necessary just needs to take a walk down the south uh, uh, portion of um, the 200 to 300 block of South Potomac Street because it, uh, I mean, there's hundreds of pieces of trash every step of the way. Any other discussion? All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed say no. Motion carries and the ordinance is introduced. Item three is the introduction of an ordinance to amend Chapter 64-8 Property Maintenance Code, Section 307 of the City Code. Mr. Mayor, I hereby move that the Mayor and the City Council introduce an ordinance to amend Chapter 64-8 Property Maintenance Code, Section 307, Rubbish and Garbage of the Code of the City of Hagerstown. These amendments modify several subsections regarding disposal of rubbish and garbage and regarding receptacles and containers to be consistent with the provisions in chapter 117 recycling and refuge collection the amendment to both chapters of the code regarding recycling and refuge storage and set out are intended to provide additional protections for our neighborhoods and downtown from blight and nuisance conditions Second. Motion made by Mr. Munson, second by Mr. Brubaker. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed say no. <clears throat> motion carries and the ordinance is introduced. Item four is the approval of an ordinance executing a deed of easement and maintenance agreement with the Housing Authority of Hagerstown. This is part of the Hagerstown Cultural Trail. Mayor, I move for the approval of an ordinance authorizing the execution of a deed of easement and maintenance agreement between the City of Hagerstown and the Housing Authority of the City of Hagerstown for use as a portion of the Housing Authority property in connection with the construction and maintenance of the Hagerstown Cultural Trail. Second. Motion made by Mr. Brubaker, seconded by Mr. Munson. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed say no. 
The motion carries and the ordinance is approved, four to one. Item five is the approval of an ordinance executing a deed of easement and maintenance agreement with BMB Associates, Inc. Mayor, hereby move for the approval of an ordinance authorizing the execution of a deed of easement and maintenance agreement between the City of Hagerstown and BMB Associates, Inc. for use of a portion of its property in connection with the construction and maintenance of the Hagerstown Cultural Trail. Second. Motion made by Mr. Brubaker, second by Mr. Munson. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed say no. No. The motion carries and the ordinance is approved four to one. Item six is the approval of an ordinance accepting a quick claim deed from the Antietam Paper Building LLC for the Hagerstown Cultural Trail. Mayor hereby move for approval of an ordinance authorizing the acceptance of a quick claim deed from Antietam Paper Building LLC for 0 0.05 acres of land for use in construction and maintenance of the Hagerstown Cultural Trail. Second. Motion made by Mr. Brubaker, second by Mr. Metzner. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. No. The motion carries and the ordinance is approved for one. And item number seven is the approval of an ordinance executing a donation agreement with the Harold Mel Company. Mayor, hereby move for approval of an ordinance authorizing the execution of a donation agreement between the City of Hagerstown and the Harold Mail Company and the acceptance of the donation of 0.764 acres of land from the Harold Mail Company for use in the construction and maintenance of the Hagerstown Cultural Trail. Second. I have a motion made by Mr. Brubaker, seconded by Mr. Munson. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed say no. No. Motion carries and the ordinance is approved four to one. And that is the end of our special session agenda. So we'll adjourn that and convene and work session. The first item of business is to announce the Western Maryland Blues Fest artwork reveal for 2016. And we have Gala Shoup, our community affairs uh, coordinator, and Marianne Burke with the Washington County Arts Council here to make this announcement. Thank you. It's our pleasure to be here. Each year, the Washington County Arts Council, in conjunction with the Blues Fest Committee, uh, issues a call in late summer, early fall, issues a call for art. Um, generally, that call goes up and down the eastern seaboard, and the committee then chooses the one piece that will be used for all the promotions for the uh, festival this year. And we're lucky each year we get a num significant number of uh, entries, it's totally a blind call. We do not, we only see the piece and the name of the piece. We do not see the name of the artist until the piece is selected. So tonight we're happy to unveil the work of Poncho, Larry Poncho Brown, who's a Baltimore native. Ooh, that's nice. um, a yeah. very, very top artist in the community. Wow. He's a native of Baltimore. He started his first art projects when he was 17. He started painting signs. And then he uh, went on and got a bachelor's of arts, of fine arts, and um, a degree from Maryland Institute of College of Art in Baltimore. He has a passion for being uh, involved with charitable organizations, and each year tries to support several in the community to support nonprofits and the African American community. So we're thrilled to have him, uh, really a, a high caliber artist, Excellent. chosen this year. Well, let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> I was not able to be here this evening, so I'll accept this award. <laughs> Thank you. It really uh, lends itself well to all the uh, designs and graphics and advertising that we have to do. Yes, and he cool. is high caliber uh, in the state of Maryland and uh, very well recognized, and we're anxious to have him come up to our community. And um, his work will be auctioned, uh, raffled rather, and it'll start this Friday evening. Yes, we actually will showcase the original piece here um, on Friday, beginning at 7 p.m., well, 5 p.m. Uh, we'll be setting up all of our merchandise. And the nice piece is, is we just had our merchandise approval pro meeting today, and I have to tell you, if the artwork itself is phenomenal, this lended itself so beautifully to our posters, our rec cards, our T-shirts. This is, is truly, you know, becoming a favorite. I, I used to love, and uh, BISFA, we've had two years of wonderful BISFA students. Um, it's entertaining now, too. We, we had submissions from them. And then to see this piece come across, it's actually called the Blues Dimension. Um, 
the interesting thing with him is he's a digital artist. So the fun is, is this is our first experience with a digital artist in 21 years. So we've got something new uh, to kind of work with. Uh, we were actually going to be getting a original canvas piece from him as well. That'll be coming a little bit later. So we are working a little in reverse. We're revealing what the poster looks like more so than the original art piece. Uh, but the really wonderful thing that he did this year is um, this was actually a piece that was previously done by him. He modified it to suit what the committee was kind of looking for once we knew we were working with him. So this has been a stellar experience. Um, as she mentioned, uh, Marian had mentioned, we are going to be opening up our raffles at the Blues Bash, which for uh, anybody listening out there or those of you, you should have received your Blues Bash tickets. Um, and we are looking forward to um, getting this out there. We'll have a special, so if you really want to have your chance at putting this up on your wall, uh, it'll be three tickets for 20 or $10 a piece, and we hope everybody makes it out to the Hamilton Loomis uh, feature at the Cabin Fever Blue Bash at Maryland Theater. Tell us more details about when and where. It'll be at the Maryland Theater this Friday. Uh, we Our show will go on at 7 p.m. Uh, tickets cost $20 at the door. You can coordinate through Ticketmaster as a lovely incentive that uh, the Maryland Theater now offers for purchasing tickets. Uh, we're looking at uh, going right off at 7. There'll be new merchandise. This is only the second year we will ever, and I don't like to jinx myself, so quote unquote, we will ever be able to offer our blues posters at the bash instead of having to hold off until the main event. So if you're somebody that has really grown with the Blues Fest, um, you can buy lots and lots of goodies well before June comes. And then the artwork will be on display at the Arts Council for those who don't get their raffle tickets. And you have an opening this Friday too, right? We do. We Would do. you like to tell uh, us more about that? The Guild, Potomac Artists Guild will be opening with a reception from 5 to 7. So before um, the Blues Bash, you can stop by the Arts Council. Right, and it ends at 7 o'clock, so you can walk right across the street. Yeah. There's lots happening in Hagerstown. That's right. Well, thank you very much. It's a great partnership between the Blues Fest Committee and the Arts Council. And, and we're happy to participate with this. It's, it's a good experience. So and we've we'll have his exhibit during this piece session. Of art to contribute to the tradition. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Thank you for having us. You bet. Should we take a picture with... Everybody here you can send it to the artist anyway. Step up. That. Come on over here. Here, I'll take it. The next item on our agenda is an action report, an update on the implementation of the community city center plan. Our distinguished team of Jill Frick and Kathy Marr coming to the table. We have some slides as well that I think are going to come up on the screen shortly. Great. There we go. We, um, for background, we released the community city center plan in July of 2014. So we're approaching two years of implementation. We have been doing regular updates with um, the mayor and council and the community on our progress as we've worked toward uh, action items and steps in implementation. Um, I wanna encourage anyone listening at home that we have um, the ability to sign up to receive electronic copies of our updates. An email address is dced at hagerstownmd.org. Um, and then we can add you to our distribution list to receive those updates. The, um, in addition for overview, we have eight catalyst projects that is a part of our 10 year plan. We're gonna go through each one and, and provide a status update. The slide on the screen shows a summary of all eight projects that are a combination of both new development initiatives as well as the expansion of uh, a number of projects that are currently underway at the time that the plan was released. Um, and there is a map available uh, connected to the plan and available on our website that provides a geographic representation of the eight projects and shows the concentration of those projects to our city center um, and re relates to the uh, impact geographically that those projects can have. 
The 10-year plan calls for uh, some broad statistics here that we have new and rehabilitated development of 463,000 square feet of either new construction or rehabilitated buildings. Uh, represents close to $125 million in, uh, in new investment, $125 billion in new investment, increased um, audience uh, of annual of 60,000 in increased audience, full-time equivalents for employment growth of 875, and new and rehabilitated uh, housing units of 178. Annual tax increment, uh, that is the increment or change in new tax revenue to both the city and county of one point, a little over 1.8 million. And going, going back, correction, 125 million in new investment. If we're very successful. If we're very successful, it would be billions, but right. yes. Um, running you through each of the uh, Catalyst Project, we're gonna tag team here. I'm gonna start out with um, Catalyst Project number one. Uh, more long-term in nature, this project calls for the construction of new Class A office space on land owned by the city in the central lot. It would be in phases where the phase one would be 70,000 square feet after three phases, a total of 154,000 uh, square feet of new office space. We're looking primarily initially at this first 70,000 square feet. We issued a request for proposals and received interest from Bowman Development. So we are in pre-development and uh, exploratory phase of this project with Bowman Development to uh, look at uh, progress on the first 70,000 square feet. Uh, Bowman would need a commitment of uh, tenants coming into a, a high percentage of that 70,000 square feet, anywhere between 20 or 25,000 pre-leased. So um, would not build the building on speculation, but would need to secure a, a tenant. And we're looking at strategies to attract um, either a, a single large user or a combination of um, smaller users making up that pre-leased uh, total in order to make the project move forward. A piece of that is the identification of incentives that are used. We've run some modeling based on a set of assumptions of the current Partners in Economic Progress program and the uh, rent relief <coughs> component of that, but we're testing our assumptions on that before we're ready to share, um, share our numbers on how that program would work. Um, However, we're also looking at more powerful incentives that could be used, including new legislation in Annapolis that could assist with this type of um, development. The PEP program alone may not be powerful enough to attract um, the, the level of new tenants into this building to see the project move forward. So again, more long-term in nature, a, a couple of key points with this project is that we think uh, Class A office space is certainly offered in the region, um, primarily outside of downtown, having the ability to offer an option to those that want the product as a downtown option we think is an important uh, position for the, for the community to be in. And in addition, we think those shopping for Class A office space may also ultimately choose Class B space and may look at existing buildings downtown. So we think this would have a benefit to existing buildings downtown. We often get the question from the community as to the uh, rear space in the central lot and would does the building take up all of the central lot or is there still the ability to program portions of the central lot for uh, events and festivals like Blues Fest and Augustoberfest and uh, the preliminary designs allow for uh, pedestrian access to the street through uh, separation between the buildings that would create a gateway into event area in the rear parking lot. I'm going to switch to Kathy for number two. Yes, the next project, Catalyst Project number two, is the Maryland Theater expansion, pro expansion project. The goal for this project is to expand and improve the facility and grow from 150 to 225 performance days per year. Increasing the audience by 60,000 annually. 
As we reported last time, new seating has been put in the theater and a hearing loop system. That's all been completed, completed last uh, a year ago this past month. They also have new HVAC uh, units in the system in the building, which was completed last year. They're in the process of doing their back of the house uh, facility improvements. And um, they received $175,000 state bond bill funding to help with this, and they're still in the process of raising the match. So if you would like to help them reach that match, they can still, uh, you can still approach the Maryland Theater about that. As was mentioned by Gala, the ticketing at the theater is available through Ticketmaster, and undoubtedly that was very helpful with the Beach Boys. This is actually a picture from the Beach Boys night from my seat at the theater, which was a <laughs> packed facility. Everyone had a great time. And Ticketmaster certainly helps in getting the word out beyond Hagerstown when something like this is at the facility. And last October, they hired a new staff member with a background in advertising, sponsorship, and promotion in order to improve this area of operation at the theater. Uh, next catalyst project number three is USMH expansion support. Uh, the goal is to support USMH growth from 500 to 750 students through the addition of new program offerings and to capture student housing opportunities with three upper floor renovation projects. Um, as we know, last year the, the phase one of the student housing was completed in August and um, as of this semester the apartments are fully leased. There are now eight students leasing the four apartments. Um, new program offerings. We mentioned in the last report that the, the uh, university was exploring the creation of three new programs, hospitality management, um, nurse practitioners, and physician's assistant. That planning is still underway. Things are very close with the new hospitality management program, provided the program is included in the system's FY17 budget and downtown space can be secured in the very near term. A new hospitality management program could be projected to begin in the fall of 17 or the spring of 18. It is anticipated the program will support 15 to 18 students per year over a two-year completion period. Full enrollment anticipated at about 30 students. Uh, next phase is of student housing. In conversations with um, Mr. Halsey at USMH about as these programs come online, when, when we might be hitting the need for more student housing, and it was his feeling that by the fall of 2017, we should be ready with six to seven more units of student housing to serve 12 to 14 students. By the fall of 19, is it anticipated another six to seven units would be necessary for 12 to 14 students. And the spring of 2021 is anticipated that another six to seven units for 12 to 14 students will be needed as the physician's assistant program ramps up. It's anticipated that most of the people who participate in that program will be moving to our area and will need to find housing. Can I just point something out? Because mm -hmm. I've heard some criticism about the student housing and what kind of impact that has. And first of all, I don't know how you can argue with four apartments and eight people being better or worse than an empty 19-room boarding house. But second of all, or a full 19-room boarding. Right, 19 boarding house. Um, but, you know, because people will look at these numbers and say, oh, well, 12 to 14 students, eight students here, like how can that have an impact? And my response to that is, the only way you eat an elephant is one bite at a time. And to me, this approach of the phases where you have, we start with eight, and then the next one is about a dozen, and the next one, and soon enough you have a critical mass. And I think that's the point that I wanted to emphasize is that we're trying to build that critical mass at this point. So I just want to put that out there. Thank you. And even though we're talking about these, these new projects that might will be coming online by these years, um, they, they had waiting lists for these four units. So undoubtedly, if developers who have renovated space were to reach out to USMH now, they might be able to get on, a, get on a list for students to know where there's housing downtown. So you don't need to wait for our projects. Right. If you have units that are suitable. Right. Yeah, and the idea of USMH. us participating as a city government was to be more of a demonstration of what is feasible and to demonstrate there is a market for this kind of housing. Right. And but we, they're not looking for just any housing. I mean, they are looking for certain qualities right. in their housing, mm -hmm. sure. Can we stress that again, that people, this doesn't have to go through a city program. Developers can get in touch with USMH in terms of getting long-term leases and the developer providing certain conditions. Is that correct? Right. And we're seeing um, developers undertaking renovations, including participation in our um, PEP program, mm -hmm. uh, with some new units expected to come online this summer 
just outside of this program by um, change in investor confidence and a private developer willing to, to take that on, recognizing the market. Does the hospitality item that you mentioned, uh, is that the same as, what does that include? Is that more ho hotel it also oriented or is a, it? a full scale commercial kitchen. So it's culinary as well. Okay. Culinary hotel restaurant management, all that. Yeah. Please continue. Which is, which is great news. Sorry about that. Um, if the city involvement in the next phases were to continue, a request for proposals for the developer partner for the next phase could occur over the winter spring of 2016. But again, those conversations have not begun as whether or not the city will be involved in phase two or whether the private sector will be handling it. Oh, didn't even show the picture. We have pictures of Patterson Hall as well as the ribbon cutting last August when the uh, units opened. And as anyone who's been by the building can see, it's a big improvement. And we are grateful for uh, the Bowens for being our first partners with that project, creating these great units. Catalyst project number four, we don't have a slide for that. Um, the goal is to construct a 200 room upper up, upscale hotel, uh, as well as uh, an adjacent conference center and establish a Civil War Heritage Center and commemorative park. Uh, this goal is more long term in nature and we've had exploratory conversations to date. Those um, conversations are more relationship building to uh, strike uh, relationships and partnerships with potential tourism and Civil War interest. Um, very preliminary, and um, but still working toward that goal with some of the early steps of relationship building. And I would just add to that that it's much more likely that the, the park will come before the hotel. Uh, and that we've, we have been meeting and, and have a strategy for moving forward with that respect. And I, I know Steve Bachmiller just walked in the room and he's uh, taking the lead in terms of the, some of the avenues we can take in, as far as creating that Civil War Heritage Park. It's really exciting stuff. Catalyst project number five is linking City Park, the Museum of Fine Arts, the A&E district with a trail, as well as um, recognizing that the trail can be a catalyst for new housing development with urban partners uh, projecting the addition of as many as 31 new townhomes, rehabilitation of buildings to create as many as 85 new loft apartments over the 10 year period. Um, so great news in the community um, over the last uh, several months, including most recent action by the council to approve uh, the construction of the trail and the first phase of the art. Um, also the completion of the acquisition of the property to allow uh, for this to move forward. Um, should be noted that the uh, level of community involvement on this project uh, with public input and uh, both an initial meeting in the fall and some, and some additional follow-up meetings, uh, so community engagement a significant part of the process by which to define how public art is displayed along the trail. And thank you to Rodney Tissue and his team. Um, should also uh, mention that many of the implementation, while Kathy and I report, there's uh, members from across departments that are assisting us with the implementation of all eight Catalyst projects. So a, a special thank you to Rodney for this initiative. Catalyst project number six is expanded downtown arts and events programming. Uh, we have previously reported on an, a number of uh, either existing events that have been expanded or new events that have been added. Um, those include the pop-up shops, Sounds in the Square programs, expansion of the Wind Down Fridays, St. Patrick's Day Run, uh, the re us receiving the Main Street designation. We're approaching the one-year mark of having more than 50 volunteers across five work groups that are assisting us in uh, events programming as well as other marketing efforts for the downtown through the Main Street program, uh, including the second Saturday series which began in the fall and a recent announcement of receiving a 
state grant from um, the Main Street uh, program at the state level of $10,000 that will support the second Saturday series. The engine room art space uh, opened in the summer of last year. They have uh, regular events and activities inside the uh, gallery space. Um, all four units of the um, uh, artist lofts above the engine room art space are, are full with uh, artists that are contributing to the gallery space as well as um, residents of the downtown area. We had the uh, downtown summer slide festival in 2015 and there's plans underway to expand that event for 2016. The New Year's Eve donut drop experienced increased attendance this past year and continues to grow and be a, a highlight activity for the downtown in uh, partnership with What's Next and other partners on that event. We're working um, on a set of uh, event guidelines to be developed by staff that will serve as a resource for people looking to do events in the downtown and this will create opportunities for us to have more events downtown but also um, work efficiently with staff time and resources um, for uh, guidance of uh, groups that are looking to use downtown as their venue for special events. And Catalyst project number seven is expanded operations of the city farmers market. The goal is to expand operations from seven to 35 hours per week, implement a private management approach and make necessary capital improvements rebrand the market, recruit additional uh, tenants. Uh, we had a public input meeting last August on just what the community's uh, hopes and dreams and goals for the farmer's market were. We distributed an RFP on November 30th for uh, private management of the farmer's market. By the January 15th deadline, um, we only received one submittal. And as we reviewed it and determined it did not adequately address the similar requirements, we had to let that applicant know that we would not move forward with that, that proposal, that in fact we would need to get back with the mayor and council to um, assess, uh, consider alternatives, consider the opportunity to repost the RFP, and determine a path forward to implement this catalyst project. We'll also follow up with the folks that uh, indicated they were interested in the RFP and who came for a tour of the market to find out why it was they did not respond. What is that, what does that time frame look like for discussion with Mayor and Council on alternatives? Um, I don't know if we've nailed down the next time, but it'll be soon. I would say within the next month or two at least. I, I, I guess my curiosity is is uh, several fold. One is we got a budget that we're coming up on. Uh, we currently spend, I believe, in excess of hundred thousand dollars a year uh, on the, the this uh, uh, amenity. Um, we don't have the level of interest, and I don't think it's a reflection of of failure in any way. By the way, and I know we keep saying that about the farmers market. Um, yet, I think within the Urban Partners report, what they identified is there is a shortage of availability for uh, individuals, especially within the urban core, for accessibility to, to uh, um, uh, food sales. Um, you know, and so I guess in my mind, I, I continue to sit here and, and think how much money we're putting in and the fact that you hear all the time, I don't know if anybody else does, but you know, uh, the necessity of a grocery store or some something that is you know accessibly food oriented uh, you know at the same time I hear again uh, we had a good example EDC meeting what was it uh, last month where uh, Mrs. Fulton who's on the EDC I mean they own the cows and the convenience stores and she made it very clear that within this market given the availability of agricultural uh, product they can't even put their own milk in their own convenience stores and be competitive that they've got to find the markets where their, their milk bears a greater market value. Anyway, um, you know, and then on the flip side of that, you, you mentioned that University System of Maryland is, is looking for you know, uh, a location for culinary. And I guess for me, I just don't want to sort of pigeonhole us in this thought process and forego any 
other opportunities such as that, you know, in the broader discussion. You know, if, if I keep feeling that the Urban Partners Plan is if one thing doesn't work, it doesn't mean that nothing works. Right. It means right. that you, you know, broaden out that flexibility and, and consider those alternatives. So that's why I asked the question, you know, what's the time frame? Because here's an entity that may have a time frame in which they need to seek, you know, a location that you're trying to provide. And, and the other time frame is we have a budget to deliberate on, you know, in the coming months. And I, and I hate to see them sort of miss. I think there's that. definitely no preconceived notion of what the next step is going to be other than we come back to the drawing board and have this discussion in more depth about what next steps you want to take. But just to put it out there, if we're brainstorming, I mean, I hear you saying that, you know, we could partner with USMH on, on their culinary program or at least aspects of it. Uh, but we could also, um, and I haven't discussed this with them yet, but, uh, you know, see if perhaps the business uh, management program is interested in some kind of partnership in managing and uh, revamping the market as well, that we tap into those students and their imaginations and creativity and entrepreneurial spirit uh, to also, you know, that's one other idea that we can. So I think there's a lot of different directions we can go. And again, I don't see the lack of, of rigorous responses as a failure. I think it's just we need to go out there and talk to more people about what they're looking for in order to get them to respond. Uh, not to favor any particular applicant, uh, but just to see what were the drawbacks in the, the previous RFP, what improvements, if any, would make, and then, again, look at all the possibilities. But I don't think we can have that conversation in a vacuum. In other words, you've got, I think it's the Elks, right? You've got uh, uh, the county and a number of entities that, that have these farmers markets that, 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 that you know, get them built up to, to a limited degree and, and that have these competing efforts going on and I just keep looking at this issue as, as an issue of you know how big and how many you know is going to be markedly uh, successful. Yeah, but and, those other markets aren't they still like not, not fly by night but they're once a week and for limited hours I mean that's still I'd say they're One no different the than ours, and they're, they're, right. they're competing for no less than the same right. base that we are. But I don't think we should forget about the opportunity to take that type of funding and invest it in, you know, incentivizing uh, a potential uh, grocery chain from, you know, from, being, from, from coming in. Uh, closer into the community. I mm -hmm. don't want to forgo yeah. that issue either. Sure. And there are, uh, actually, to the contrary, most of the types of farmers markets I think that Kristen was alluding to are seven days a week, uh, whether it's Greensburg Market mm -hmm. or it's the markets out on Jefferson Boulevard or some of these others during the season. Oh, obviously. sure. Right, right. Uh, and, you know, seasonal, they create a great competition because that's. Mm -hmm. To a large degree, that's what this market is really up against. Or you can take, as Kristen said, you can drive your car out at your convenience. Right. But they're also open past noon on a Saturday. I right. Mean, I they're that's open. Right. Exactly. Like, well, that's, hours that's exactly, that's exactly right. Yeah. right. But proprietors, proprietors aren't required to be there to sell. Uh, we have an right. individual, I believe, that grows right. uh, loose leaf lettuce in our, in our own city, uh, you know, farm. Uh, um, Garden. Garden plots that sells it at Valley Co-op because they don't have to be there doing right, it. And I just right. look at those and say, you know, how competitive right. can we be when, when there's, you know, 12 to 15 to 20 entities, right. not even counting the people that are doing it as actual farm operations. When know. it's a business model, too. I right. Mean, yeah. That's part of it. Yeah. Anyway, we digress. Yes. We'll definitely be coming back soon, though, to have this discussion more in depth. Could I just follow sure. up? Are we finished with number eight? We don't have to be. You mean with the farmer's market? Numbers. Yeah, number seven? We haven't done eight yet. Okay, I, I just I want to come back and discuss the engine room. Sure. Um, is, there, is, is there any indication <coughs> that uh, attendance at the engine room is picking up? I think so, yes. Um, we have not measured it. Um, precisely, but anecdotally, um, I hear from our gallery coordinator of the success of the events. Um, we can begin to quantify that 
and uh, start to measure the, the number of um, attendees at events? It might not be a bad idea to start quantifying it, but suppose somebody, some private organization, decided to uh, hold a reception there. Could, uh, could they rent the space uh, to have food brought in uh, and, and have a reception there? Are we, are we doing that sort of thing with it? We're, we're not doing that uh, <coughs> currently in, in terms of a, um, public, a public building. We're uh, operating it as uh, free and open to the public. We right. have not um, created a set of guidelines for how it might be used uh, as a rental space. Uh, that could be something we would consider. Um, I think it would be important to bring it back. Um, uh, once we establish as a, it's I think less than a year old so the idea of um, creating those guidelines uh, and bringing them back to you for review it's a good idea though good yeah I'd appreciate it and um, the one uh, the other advantage it has for us is that most people using it utilizing it would use the parking garage so that would mean more revenues from that source as well mm -hmm. Thank you. It's a good idea. Thanks. Okay, catalyst project number eight is expanded and targeted home ownership support. The goal is to market home ownership incentives, support neighborhoods first programs, establish annual rental licensing inspections, and continue excessive nuisance enforcement programs. Back in um, Late 2014, we amended the rental registration program, the vacant structures program, to make those to be better tools for us to protect our neighborhoods. We um, hired the additional staff that were authorized by Mass, uh, by, <laughs> by Mass, that were authorized by the Mayor and City Council, so that we would have the resources we needed to to have these programs be more ramped up, particularly vacant structures program, and all of those positions were filled. Um, we, uh, the home ownership program, we received a $100,000 community legacy grant in FY15, and we received another $150,000 community legacy grant with last year's application, FY16, so that will enable us to acquire more homes for home ownership. Currently, I'll, I'll skip down to number seven since we're talking about home ownership. The city acquired two properties on South Prospect Street and one property at 64 East Franklin Street two of which we are renovating to create opportunities for home ownership. 261 South Prospect would be turned, it's a two family, would be turned into two condominiums. Uh, 64 East Franklin Street will be turned into a single family. It's a uh, second empire townhouse next to what had been a pizza place on East Franklin Street. And then 278 South Prospect Street, um, we put through the competitive negotiated sales process and had to, um, to sell it, not for us to rehab it, but to sell it straight off for home ownership. That's the house at the end of Prospect Street on the left as you're heading towards the park. We received uh, two, uh, two proposals that are being uh, assessed by the city currently. Which, that's great news. And the vacant structures program, that we're about a year into the, the full-scale implementation of the program. We have 908 blighted and non-blighted vacant properties identified as of late February. 36% of those are considered blighted. Uh, the registration process is ongoing. As, as you imagine, most of these um, are going through foreclosures or whatever, so the registration can be a bit challenging at times. 242 exterior inspections have occurred already and 29 interior inspections uh, as of late February. We're going to give you an update in April with more detail about how the program is functioning currently as well as some thoughts we're receiving from others about how we might want to tweak it, particularly in the case of the non-blighted residentials, whether we want to loosen that up a bit. So we'll have, we'll have detail for you on that, what the imp impact of the program would be, and, um, and just get a good discussion going on if we're satisfied with where we are in this program, if you want to make some tweaks. But it definitely, um, there were a lot of... Out of vacant buildings out there. Uh, let's see, is there anything else? Oh, the city center residency initiative. Seven homes were purchased with down payment assistance through the city program uh, since December 13th to December 2013, and 18 residents are renting with the rental payment assistance program since December 2013. Great. Oh, and I forgot to show these. These are the pictures of the houses that the city had acquired for home ownership assistance. Can I just mention, I, since it was such a nice day, I took a walk through Central Lot and back around coming 
down Franklin Street towards City Hall because I wanted to see the improvements being made at 63 East Franklin, a building owned by Ken Berry. Uh, he put $40,000 into a new dance studio for the Hagerstown City Ballet. And I just so happened to be walking by when he was getting out of his car, so he was kind enough to take me on a tour. And what a great facility that is, um, not only for the City Ballet, but also uh, he renovated the six apartments above uh, the dance studio. Uh, there was one that was vacant, so he let me peek my head in there. Nice apartments. I mean, nothing spectacular, but uh, clean and, uh, you know, good, good space. <clears throat> but interestingly, the, he also owns the building where Vincent's Pizza was, and there's a new uh, company, a new food business that's in there that does mostly catering, and the owner of that now lives in one of the apartments mm -hmm above the dance studio. So this idea that, you know, people want to live and work uh, and own businesses in downtown all in the same space is really coming to fruition and I actually mentioned to him that, you know, he might want to have a chat with USMH about student housing. Um, and he was very complimentary of the city starting to get to work on that building at 64 East Franklin Street because it will present a much better view from across the street and also, uh, you know, greatly enhance the neighborhood. But he was very excited about the city's uh, purchase and rehab of that property. Well, that whole block face is one of our concentration areas. Right. So it's certainly, you know, not just what the city's doing, but also what folks in the private sector are doing. And it really, I think it does indicate that there is increased investor confidence, uh, just knowing that the city has a plan and is also leading by example in taking some of these properties and turning them around. And 63 so. East Franklin is actually one of our first third grant recipients mm -hmm. for the renovation for the City Ballet School. Right. So it's working. And he's also uh, renovating the apartment building that got burned out a couple well, years, ago. Well, the so years ago. Work is happening on that too. And the uh, pet roof across the front. And he also mentioned that those apartments would have washer and dryer and, you know, so he's really upgrading the quality of the housing that he's offering. So just thought I'd throw that out there. Great presentation. Does anyone have any questions for staff about this update? Again, we'll continue to put these items on the agenda as we need to. Go ahead. Just a comment. Um, first, thank you for the presentation. It's very positive, very upbeat. And I think uh, what's been accomplished so far uh, in not very much time sort of validates the strategy of, of the uh, mayor and city council in uh, doing the urban partners plan and following the plan. And, and I know and we all know how much time and effort you all put into it and we're very appreciative of that. Thank you. Indeed. This, we promised that this plan would not collect dust on the shelf, and I think we're yes. living up to that promise. That's right. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And now we will have the city administrator's comments. Nothing additional tonight, Mr. Mayor? All right. We'll start with council comments. Mr. Metzner, would you like to start us off? <coughs> Congratulations this morning uh, what the state of the city address was uh, very well done very well attended and I congratulate you and staff for putting it together um, the only other thing I would add is Don Kristen Penny and I had the um, very enjoyable time on Saturday to visit a very historical site in Hagerstown and unbeknownst to me probably the leading manufacturer in North America of cold storage doors at Jameson Door Company, uh, celebrating their 110th anniversary. And um, it was a wonderful event, probably attended by over 300. And I think we all learned uh, a lot of things. And the one thing I commented out there was being a lifelong resident of Hagerstown and being on this body for the number of years. And, and when you look at where Jamison is, which is a, a major manufacturing plant bordered on one side by a very high-end neighborhood and bordered on the other side by a different type of, of community. 
And you know, has any one of us ever heard one single solitary negative word about Jamison Door Company from a neighbor, from an employee, from anybody in 110 years of being there? <laughs> Their wall of 30-year employees was extremely impressive. It's clear that people who work at Jamison stay at Jamison, and it is very family-oriented. And uh, another thing I learned was the original Jamisons and the original Hamiltons are all related. To, uh, those when you when you meet the, the owners of the Jamisons, you're meeting the Hamilton family and the Jamison family. So it, it was quite an event and. Um, something to be very proud of in Hagerstown. This company has uh, manufacturing in Mexico, all staying in Mexico, so they didn't outsource anything, and also have uh, bought a major company, if I'm correct, was in Wisconsin or Montana, uh, that makes air doors. So it was, it was fascinating. We all had a good time, and congratulations to them. Well, thank you all for attending, uh, especially in my absence. I wasn't able to be there. How many employees do they have now, did they say? No, they didn't say. But it is remarkable that, you know, 110 years, uh, they're still in business. And like you said, they're, uh, you really wouldn't even notice that they're there if you were to drive by. Uh, but it's obviously that, that they're a great community asset. So thank you. Ms. Nye? Um, with the proposals that were tonight um, with the trash, when I was coming here tonight and looking at what we continue to have on the street, hoping that this will curtail some. I don't know that it will, but it's a matter of now hopefully looking at those with the big apartment buildings. With those who have renters in there, in them, it would seem to me that the person owning the buildings would have a person on hand to see that everything is clean on the outside. And I think that that should be a next step in a suggestion too, because as much as what we can have the trash cans there, we can have the trash in the cans, it's still a matter of tidying up on the outside. And you know, I know that some do, and it's okay, can't we not get that message out? And this continuing to be a habitual thing with setting out of furniture. And I don't know how that's going to ever get taken care of, but it's becoming more and more and more. Yeah, I know that I had called about three yesterday, and then someone had seen coming from the state of the city as far as, again, trash being out. And there's no way that we can say, hey, this belongs to you. Mm -hmm. But it certainly is a major problem. And again, I go back to clean streets, clean town. Sure. First impressions. You got it. That's it. All right. Mr. Munson? Uh, no additional comments. So. All right. Mr. Alshire? Um, just to follow up on Lou's comments about Jamison Door, I think uh, my oldest daughter Greenlee went with me. I think our surprise was how large the structure is inside. Um, uh, but I, <laughs> the thing we found most impressive was that uh, uh, the door that we were most impressed by wasn't even a door at all. Uh, it was sort of this wall of air right. that they create for refrigeration units to separate it from in-store versus out-of-store mm -hmm. because employees uh, at times, you know, tracking things in and out don't close the door. So that was, uh, that was fairly interesting. Mm -hmm. um, the other comment, I made it earlier, um, and, and I've actually shared uh, an idea with staff, is uh, the accumulation of, of, of trash uh, in some areas. And it's clearly from... from, from Blowing about, you know, windier conditions of set outs, but you know, the 200 block of South Potomac is, is a prime example of that. And the unfortunate part is it's sort of like a wind tunnel through there. And so, you know, trash gets set out, that night it gets sucked out. But when I take uh, Hadley to, to, to daycare there at Rehoboth and Williamsport, uh, a couple of times a year they actually will blow that area, much like we do the Mummer's Parade, we'll blow it out into the street, and then the street sweeper comes by, you know, a little bit later. And so, some type of program to that effect may be effective at uh, eliminating some of that if you were due to that, you know, two or three times a year, 
uh, to address some of that issue. So the storm drains too. And I mean to interrupt you, but that just it hit me when you said about blowing. Mm -hmm. The storm drains are collecting up. And I well, think, I think a lot of that's left over from they snow and well, ice. Well, we have yeah. we have what is there that are leaves still. Mm -hmm. And again, I don't know what it is that we have at Public Works, but we need to get that yeah. that whatever mm -hmm. the part of the truck that can actually mm -hmm. get down and scoop it away. Mm -hmm. We've got more than just one type of drain but it can it continues to collect and of course well, we'll talk to we i think they have a, like a spring There's cleaning a schedule that they, they yeah. do that but, so you know, we'll I mean, when it comes down them. to it it's just a nightmare in some of the parts of the city mm -hmm. anything else mr Rauschen? mr brubaker yes uh, i i regret that i couldn't be at the jameson uh event uh when i was on the economic development commission for six years I went through so many places in this area that actually make things, and Jameson is one that I regret uh, uh, that I was not able to get through. Maybe I'll be able to catch up on it. You know, from the scale of Volvo on down to mm -hmm. in the smaller places, mm -hmm. you know, uh, mom and pop shops. Uh, mm -hmm. There's so many places left. We used to be a hundred years ago a maker for the world. If you look, I have a, some mm -hmm. old books from those days, and it's really interesting. I always to like see to say all the different. You name it, we made it here in Hagerstown at one point yes, or another. Yes, and I forgot to bring it in again. I mm -hmm. promised to show some people, but um, in any event, we still have quite a residual. And uh, uh, again, we actually make things in Hagerstown, and that is that's so cool. And the the second thing is, I just want to follow up on how excellent the the state of the city work was by the staff. Uh, Mayor uh, made a nice presentation for us, but uh, I want to thank the, the staff in particular for the film. And um, uh, all of us got kudos from many people in the audience, I want to say, afterwards uh, about how well the representative of the city was. So from staff on up through my peers, I think uh, it went well. Thank you. Um, the only comment I have is to um, congratulate all the winners from the Chamber of Commerce Business Awards. We attended last Wednesday, Thursday evening. Um, Wednesday, one of those days last week. They're all blending together. Um, but it was a very well put together event and all the winners uh, were certainly well deserving. And I didn't bring my list, but they know who they are. Um, uh, but it's nice that the, the city is an active member of the Chamber of Commerce and supports those kinds of events because we do recognize the power and the strength of our business community is really the heart of, of our community. So I'm going to thank them and also thank them for hosting the State of the City this morning. And just want to remind folks who couldn't make it this morning that we'll be at the library this evening at 630 uh, for another round of the State of the City. So. Unless anyone has anything else, we will be adjourned until then. Thank you very much.